My brother-in-law peed on my belongings for months. Discovering a horrifying family history of abuse destroyed my marriage. For months, my brother-in-law left me pee on my stuff. Finding out why revealed a terrible family background that shattered my marriage. For 10 years, Ted, 34M, my spouse and I, 29F, had been together. We dated all through and got early in college. I completed before him and spent a semester traveling while he was finishing so we might relocate to another state. He ended up needing to repeat several classes, hence when I returned we couldn't relocate yet. Since I had nowhere of my own, I moved in with Ted and his roommate Ash, 32M, as he was still in school. I made sure Ted approved it with Ash before we moved so my male cat could accompany us. Their dog was elderly, but Ash claimed he was good with it. About three weeks after we moved in, I began to notice that our bedroom smelled strongly of urine and we were unable to locate its source. I knew it wasn't my cat since she is toilet trained. The dog couldn't enter our room since it is on the second story and he suffers hip issues. I began to find clothing on the floor smelling like urine. When I asked Ted he said he knew nothing. I questioned Ash if he was bringing the dog upstairs after three months of annoyance and this occurring around twice a week. No, he replied. I had had enough at this time. I stopped leaving garments anywhere, but I was still discovering pee and stuff like throw pillows, shoes and so forth. After breaking down one day, Ash proposed it was my cat claiming his territory, as male cats are notorious for doing. Since it was simply on my belongings and a new location, he felt it made sense. If any of you own cats, you are aware that their pee smells different from human pee. I put up a webcam in our room since I trust my cat completely. My boyfriend knew about my rent payment, therefore I reasoned this was the best method to find out where the pee was coming from. Ash was indeed walking into our room and pissing on my belongings. After seeing the movie, I packed my belongings and my cat and stayed with a friend until Ted graduated and we moved. Ted and I handled that, hence when all of this was happening I avoided facing him. Not really spoken to Ash since then. Though we usually avoid each other at family events, he was the best man at the wedding. Ash lost his job and housing with the epidemic and is quite broke. He wanted to move in with us, but I really don't want to since he left urine on my belongings. When it happened, he was a grown man, 25 years old. Their entire family is now calling and texting, telling me I'm an ass for leaving him homeless in the middle of an epidemic. Still, it wasn't their belongings that were left pee-stained on. Although he is losing his house and his cat deserves a home, I am harboring resentment since he left urine on my belongings. I cannot simply grab his pet and abandon him to the elements, it was made rather abundantly apparent, although I know I'm justified, Ted claims he couldn't do that to his brother, and the employment situation is better here for his kind of work. First edit number one. I appreciate all of you spending time to consider my present situation. I had to stop responding for a bit as I'm at work right now, but I'll get back to everyone in the morning. A few of questions have surfaced several times. He is in therapy? After Ted's mother made him go, he was last I checked. That's how we learned the reason he did this. Our best friends were Ash and Ted, me entering Ted's life threatened enough to for him to want to separate us. Clearly, it failed and it only caused Ted to go no contact temporarily. According to his therapist, Ash owed his brother apologies. My mother-in-law, the person who got them back in touch, said Ash asked for pardon for his deeds. I could deal with it as long as I didn't have to be with him and he never set foot in our house. They reunited. Why did he show up for the wedding? The celebration for our parents predominated when we were getting married. Although my parents planned a large wedding as I am the first of my sisters to be married, we were not bothered about the courthouse. We could not exclude Ted since all of his brothers and all of my sisters were bridesmaids and groomsmen. After all, Ted and Ash are best friends. I didn't care as long as I didn't have to snap selfies with him and he didn't deliver a speech. Why cannot any of his family accompany him? While the rest of the family resides on the West Coast, we live on the East Coast. After several comments, I'm beginning to question this next section, but I'll say it nonetheless as that's the facts I know. Ted's career is far more employable on the East Coast than on the West, thus going across would reduce his prospects of getting a new work in his sector. I am working to persuade every brother, there are eight more, to contribute in a small amount so, between us all, he can stay there. Why would they find me to be an ass? His entire family forgives and lets go quite naturally. Things that are horrible to me, car theft, false college degrees, money theft, have been pardoned by them. They so truly believe that this was only a one-time occurrence and that has outgrown it. I simply need to get over it. Apologized he asked? I find it somewhat sour that he apologized to Ted but not to me. Though you guys are right, 
it would be self-serving of him and a means of getting back into my house and maybe causing further problems, I was thinking of accepting an apology. Paid for the items he left behind? I just kept washing the urine-stained items as I had no idea where the pee was coming from. Following the video, I did toss anything I recall having been urinated on, that which had no emotional worth. Still, there are two pairs of damaged shoes in my house right now. He did not pay for the items I tossed, and to be honest, I never considered asking him. Should I merely cut my losses? On this, what is your husband's stance? Ted is the greatest human being in the universe. He really tolerates enough of my pranks to let Ash move in if it would make him happy. Ted was agitated and cut off totally as soon as things started. They made up though, as his mother mentioned the therapist thought it would enable him to atone. Ted has never once urged me to be with Ash or for him to visit our house. Ted assured me it was very fine if I turned Ash down as the best man when we got married. Still, I love him enough to handle him when it's called for, such around Christmas and major family gatherings. Are the videos visible to me? Though I regret to let you down, no. Though I'm annoyed as I could be at the man, I do respect privacy. I honestly wouldn't believe me if he told me one of my sisters was peeing on his belongings, hence when it happened I just gave it to Ted so he would believe me. To the best my knowledge, he has only given it to two of the elder brothers and his parents to prove we were not fabricating things. Curious as I am, I would want to thank you for your medals. They are beautiful and shiny and make me feel as though I recently came out victorious from the Olympics. You folks are the finest. I also want to thank you for the really great nicknames and jokes. I will be leaving him a litter box and puppy training pads in the guest room just to rub his nose in, should I lose this fight and he relocate here. You people are the best. I swear to reply to messages and comments as soon as I can. Edit number 2. Mini update. P has thus hit the fan in the family, and my day has been terrible. The family lacked the complete picture. Some of the other brothers saw this post and all of your comments. Not apparently did our brothers either. I'm way over my head, hence numbers 3, 4 and 8 are on their way here to handle it. The messages saying me I most likely had it coming, that I wanted it, or that I deserved it deserve a big F you. I wish the P-Man pays you a visit and stains your toothbrush. I appreciate your wonderful comments and worry. I appreciate the reality check references. I appreciate you waking me to my several flaws. Though things suck right now, hopefully in a few days I will be able to provide you guys closure or at least additional responses. Remain hydrated. Update 1, as you all advised, I showed Ted the post. Ted realized he had done wrong by me after reading some comments. Though I was cool with it, it was still improper of him and the entire family to be as they are. When the whole event happened, he sincerely apologized for not asking more from his brother, family, and self. Ash moving in with us was certainly not going to happen, he stated. He also inquired of various professional acquaintances whether Ash could get work as an engineer. One of those contacts turned out to be someone employed by the same company Ash did. He informed Ted Ash hadn't been sacked, he had quit but was welcome to have his job returned. Ted went to face Ash about this. We reside some many hours apart. It brings me joy, not because my husband is lacking in any kind. Ted found some stuff that started a chain of events and truth unveilings that, to be honest, just make me sad more than anything else. While I was at work, I worked two jobs, one part-time during the day because I wanted to. Yes, yes, I realize I'm being cowardly once more and should be furious, but right now I'm exhausted and want to sleep. But I believed I owed you guys closure since I had enough pleasant and nasty notes. Though right now I don't care. I'm most likely going to get trash for revealing all of this. This is a resumed but still somewhat long, rendition of all that has occurred since my OP. B stands for brother of Ted. If I say wife hash X, please refer to the number of the brother, not that any of them have multiple wives. B number 1, doctor with some type of military background, wife, 3 kids. B number 2, surgeon, wife, 2 dogs, and a bearded dragon. B number 3, engineer, fiancé, and dog. B number 4, teacher and researcher, wife, one kid. B number 5, works in IT, not sure of details, wife. B number 6, doctor, single and ready to mingle. B number 7, chef, businessman, wife, one kid. B number 8, car sales, wife, three kids, fish. B number 9, Ted, wife and cat. B number 10, Ash. I went down with Ted to discuss all you highlighted. He really apologies, we vowed to do and be better and we sob together. His family is difficult, as you are now well know, and not rocking the boat became second nature to him. We both agreed to attend individual therapy. Should both therapists recommend couples therapy, we will also undergo couples therapy. To somewhat brighten me, 
he ordered a t-shirt bearing the most okayest human in the universe. Ted called his contacts anyhow and discovered Ash hadn't quit. Furious about all the fuss this is generating, he goes to face him. He behaves in his place, Ash is absent. Ted goes in anyhow and waits since he carries an emergency key. Eventually he has to use the guest bathroom, but it is locked. So he enters his room and discovers a situation, this was the word he used to describe it. He told me to remain home, called me, and claimed he would be home later since he had to engage his family and wanted not to subject me to more than he already had, which had me thinking the worst. I was terrified at that moment and implored him to come back soon and be careful. About two hours later, wife number eight calls me sobbing to check on me. I say Ted told me briefly about the circumstances. I haven't heard since. I asked her whether I wanted to know, which I did and she begins by apologizing and then says they didn't know the complete story. After reading my post, B number 5 called B number 7 to voice disapproval of me distributing the story online. Apparently, he knew it was our family since having your stuff pee on isn't common enough. B number 7 then states there are several things about my account of events that sound off to him. By now they've all read it, he calls B number 2, who calls their mother. I did miss calls from B number 6 and B number 2 as I was working. Still, as many of you suspected, Ash's tale had a flimsy therapist component. It turns out that the therapist he had been visiting was a buddy of his with zero genuine expertise and merely claimed to be his therapist so his mother would be off his back about it. For approximately three years, he pretended to be attending therapy, which his mother paid for. When my MIL discovered it, she kept it under wraps and claimed to have forgiven other brothers for worse. All of this came to light when B number two questioned her about Ash's refusal to apologize to me. They were under the mistaken notion that he had apologized and I had forgiven him, because I have a history of being a doormat, and he was best man, which is why they were pressuring him to live with us. They also had no idea the territorial dispute had been ongoing for months. They were aware of a few incidents, but not as many as there were. Back to wife number 8. She informs me that B numbers 3, 4 and 8 are on their way because Ted requested assistance, which frightened me out. She tells me to talk to wife number 1 because she needs some help. I hang up and Ted has been calling me while I was on the phone. He continued claiming he was sorry and that his brothers would take care of everything. So I simply told him to spit it out, that I had just spoken with wife number 8 and didn't have the patience to be kept in the dark. Apparently, Ash has some mental issues and despises me. He photographed me on his bathroom wall, which was smeared in pee and possibly other human fluids. He appears to have had some of B number 1's daughter, F14. I'm honestly not sure what she did to him to deserve this. Ted, disgusted and outraged, walks into his bedroom and discovers photo books on his nightstand that were meant to be at his parents' house. You can guess which photographs were cut out and scratched off. All of the comments about manic behavior were more realistic than I would have wanted, and he dropped out of disgust when he saw our yellow-stained wedding photo. He goes to get it and discovers the cat under the bed, scared and starving. When he coaxed her out, she was still covered in dried pee and other bodily fluids. At this point, B number 6 phones him because I did not answer. Ted tells him what he discovered, that Ash is not home, and that he had to take the cat to the clinic. B number 6 orders him to stay there till they figure out where Ash is. They begin calling each other. B number 1 is furious, threatening to murder him because of his daughter, which is why he didn't attend. Now that all of the brothers are aware, there are a variety of emotions running high, ranging from wrath to concern. They do not know where Ash is. Ted phones his mother to scold her for lying, covering up and reconciling them, despite the fact that she had no idea he was lying about the therapy when they were reunited. She cried and stated she knew B numbers 1 through 8 had plagued Ash when he was a child, and she had done nothing about it, failing as a parent. She claimed she was attempting to make amends by protecting him. When we got married, my mother-in-law was quite strict with Ash, and I assumed she was being protective. Later, Ted informed me that he recalled his mother questioning if it was a good idea to have him as best man, which we both overlooked as weird. She had always urged Ted to be involved in Ash's life, as she explained to him after their fight, claiming that the more present Ted was in his life, the more stable he was. She stated that she never told him since she did not want to put him under such pressure. Ted claimed that by the time she knew he was lying, he appeared to be in good health and had overcome his problems. After hanging up with his mother, he contacted me to apologize and tell me everything. I called out of my other job because I cannot go to work like this. I have a lot to think about, but I will keep you updated. I called Ted and informed him I was on my way since someone needed to care for the cat. He stated he didn't want me to see any of that, but I'm really worried about the cat. At this point I am just numb and want to feel helpful. About an hour into the drive, I received a notice from our ring doorbell, 
which logs visitors to your door, and it was a delivery of sunflowers, Ted's favorite flower. He is quite confident in his manhood, so please do not turn this into a thing. I instructed the delivery person to read me the card. With this form of doorbell, you can communicate with the person at the door, and Ash said something along the lines of, OP did me dirty by sharing our difficulties publicly. Whatever results from that will be her responsibility. I've just broken down. I had to pull over and cry my heart out. I asked my neighbor to please take the flowers and throw them out. I emailed Ted a picture and then drove back to my sister's house because I honestly don't know what to do. I am so bewildered and everything is so twisted up. I had a large family before all of this happened, and I feel like I lost a lot of individuals I cared about and thought of as family. But even in my protected world, I can't see or justify what's going on right now. I do not want to lose my husband, and I'm concerned about the cat. I'm afraid Ashton will hurt himself or my spouse. I phoned wife number one, and she is quite concerned for her daughter. I don't want her to feel terrified, but I can't soothe her since I'm also scared. I cognitively understand that none of this is my responsibility, but I am the link between everything that has happened, and I simply don't know what to do. I'm okay, or as fine as anyone can be in this situation. Ted is with me at my parents' house. He brought me my cat, because having a cat on your lap makes life less miserable. Where should I start? You'll probably have a thousand questions by now, and I'm not sure how to answer them because I've just been waiting to upload everything. Maybe I won't post it at all and leave you all guessing. I will admit that this scenario and some of the comments I've received have caused me to lose some trust in humanity, but I suppose that's part of what makes us human. You want to know what the worst aspect of all this is? I have actual PTSD, and I no longer phrase it in a weird way. Every time I hear someone pee, as in pee hitting the water, I get a feeling of dread in my chest, and the world turns a little staticky. Going to the bathroom on my own has been quite an adventure. I had my first therapy appointment however. We, fortunately and tragically, live in a world where you can just throw money and make anything happen. Thank you, Daddy, for paying for the emergency shrink. That was an update on how I'm doing, as some of you have asked, but I'll get to the point and why you're all here. What happened to Ash following the flower delivery? I couldn't take it any longer and went back to my sister's. Ted quickly exited and approached me. B number 6 coordinates everything else. He is my favorite brother-in-law, and I don't care whether the others know. Most of them have been rubbish to me at some point or another, with number 10 certainly taking the cake. I haven't got the courage to inquire as to what will happen to Ashley. I believe he needs assistance above all else. B number 1 plainly disagrees, and I'm guessing he's attempting to get the police involved because his daughter is underage. I requested Ted to see the photos. B number 2 advised me to document everything, which I believed would be useful. It didn't. It merely sparked additional questions, but hey, I have a therapist who can help me work through them. Right now, I don't have anything further to say. I apologize for wasting your time, but I am sure this isn't done, and I will have more to say, maybe later, maybe tomorrow. They found Ash. B numbers 3, 4, and 8 showed up to his house, and he was present this time. Apparently, he had not seen Ted's presence and was unaware of the impending storm. Punches were thrown, yelling, more punches, and one trip to the ER later, Ash is now in a psychiatric hold being evaluated for a variety of issues. Ted's mother continues to try to contact him. I'm not sure if it's to apologize or to question about what's going on because, in general, everyone is upset with her, but I'm over her. I believe this is the hardest reality check a person could ever have, yet I have learned a great deal about people, trust, and families. Based on the facts we have, Ted's mother appears to have been correct. Ted's lack of active involvement in his brother's life is what caused this craziness. I guess the epidemic and our distance contributed to his demise. He'll have to deal with it using whatever coping mechanisms they supply him, because Ted has shut off almost half of his family, hopefully for good this time, because neither of us is going to get over this anytime soon. Ash's cat, regrettably, did not make it. That's something I'll always feel sorry about. She acquired a renal ailment that went undiagnosed during the last year and it was too late to save her while she was being abused and neglected. The vet stated that based on what he was hearing, because they were calling the police on B number 4 for animal abuse, and he had to explain some of the situation, she was not going to survive without suffering, so he chose to put her down. Apparently, the issue with B number 1's daughter stemmed from his harsh bullying when they were younger. He never had much touch with her. It was all about retaliating in the most effective way he knew. His daughter will undergo treatment just in case. I'm not sure what or how much they told her, but I believe they had to ask her questions about her interactions with Ash, and they would have had to explain why they were asking. That's about it. I am not leaving my husband. 
I am not peeing on anyone's property. I'm going to therapy, and I've made it clear to everyone that none of them will ever live with us for any reason. I don't mind if the Pope is with them. I just feel like I've lost that caring part of myself, and overall, I still haven't received that apology, but to be honest, I don't want it. Perhaps my therapist will persuade me otherwise, or maybe it's for the best, but for now, I guess I'll just live with it as best I can. Update 2. The Sequel. Hello everyone, I just wanted to thank you for the amazing amount of love and support I've received from internet strangers, all of the lovely notes, and overall, for your care for me and my family. I will start responding to messages soon, I promise, it's just been a difficult few of days. My therapist suggested writing to help me organize my feelings and understand what happened, and since some of you have expressed interest, I suppose this is as good a diary as any. I believed a post-update might be a little easier to read for those who want to know what happened next in the P-Man drama. It's been nearly two weeks since I first opened the Pandora's box that is my husband's family, and you all know what happened. I will be eternally grateful to Reddit and all of you for pointing out that there were issues that needed to be addressed and investigated, even if it did wind up turning my life into a P-Show. I'm not sure how the Twitter users ended up here, but I'd want to thank you everyone for your support. Many people ask the same questions, so here are the responses. My husband and brothers-in-law. Except for number six, I don't think I'm capable of dealing with any of them right now. He has always been my favorite, and in general, we should have accepted his advice and isolated ourselves from the family. He has genuinely been the most supportive and apologetic throughout the ordeal. I did speak with number one and his wife to offer my assistance in any manner I could, but they graciously rejected, saying I had done enough. I'm not sure if they meant it backhandedly or honestly, but I'm still keeping a distance from them all. The majority of the other brothers apologized for everything. Some accepted responsibility for their roles in this messed up circumstance, while others acknowledged their previous transgressions. I believe this entire family will be financing the psychology industry for the foreseeable future. I did propose that everyone seek treatment because, while I initiated it, this is something that affects the entire family. My mother-in-law. Some compassionate Redditors pointed out that she had probably been manipulated and or abused her entire life which I don't refute or agree with, but I do know that she had a complicated existence. We will not communicate with her again till the end of time, after she called to chastise us for separating her family. Her statements went something like this. I've worked for years to get all of you together. I have forgiven all each of you has ever done. Speaking with my husband, and this is how you repay me, allowing a small, ying to come in the way of our family. So there's that. Ted, my husband, is managing everything as well as he can. He is also in treatment, working through his emotions. He keeps apologizing, and I believe seeing what his closest friend did to me because of him will bother him for a while. We read all of your comments together, and while he appreciated his atonement, he doesn't believe he earned it. He believes he has years to make up for. He also informed me that he understood if I wanted to divorce him because he couldn't live knowing what his family had done to his wife. I gently rejected, because I still love him and understand that this is not his fault. We'll see how therapy works for him. Where is Ash now? He is still on psychiatric hold. He did ask to see Ted, which was a massive no-no, and Ted declined. He did send him a letter, however. I have no idea what it says, and I don't want to know, but Ted assured me that I'd never have to see him again. When it is deemed safe, he will be relocated to the West Coast, where the rest of his family can cope with him. We have washed our hands of him forever. Number three has been in charge of his care and he believes that relocating him far away from us is best for everyone. Ted and him have been discussing the doctor's reports, but I haven't wanted to inquire, which is fine. Many of you advise that we take a break. I resigned one of my jobs and have been working at my father's beach condo. Ted is using part of his vacation time, and his boss has been extremely accommodating. It's the middle of January, so it's not really pleasant outside, but looking at the water is relaxing, and being away from all of the chaos is good. I got a new phone so his family couldn't reach me anymore, and it's been great just the three of us. The cat follows me around for a few days. Future actions. I received a protective order. In the meantime, I'm not sure what safeguards number one is taking for his daughter. I do know he made her stop using social media. If future legal action is to be taken, it must come from them. We are also relocating. I'm not sure where to go but neither of us feels like we're home anymore. We'll start looking for houses closer to my family in the coming weeks. What's behind door number two? Sorry to disappoint you but there were no human body parts or meat hooks in the closed restroom. There was more of what was discovered in the master bathroom. I don't believe he's a serial killer in the making, 
just profoundly psychologically disturbed, with bad coping methods and emotional relationships. But I'm not a professional and can't help him. I believe one Redditor made a very solid point regarding him hating women or seeing us as inferior, as he only did his thing with women, me, my niece, and Sonny, his cat. But again, I am not a professional, so I cannot comment further. How am I doing? Certain days have been better than others. I've been to therapy every other day. Thank you to the Redditors who suggested going to the restroom with headphones or a white noise machine, it was quite helpful. My sisters are taking turns visiting, so we'll have someone with us for a couple of hours in case we need anything. The backstory? Many people inquired about the bullying he experienced as a child to rationalize this type of catastrophe. So here is Ted's response to that. Growing up with eight elder brothers makes you extremely open to criticism, comparisons, and expectations. Our brothers had many years when it was just them and when the chance came to take it out on someone else, he was the most vulnerable. I'm not attempting to condone or defend anyone's behavior, but there were some things that even I couldn't keep him safe from. Now that I'm an adult, I can understand how messed up they were, and I'm sure my brothers can as well. We've all been fighting demons our entire lives. We did not have a supporting family. Everything was swept under the rug instead of being addressed. That caused us to grow up alienated from reality, what is appropriate, and what is healthy. Some of us have learned more through our marriages, occupations, and life experience. We all still have a lot to learn, but we can't undo the past. All we can do is admit our mistakes and shortcomings and strive to be better tomorrow. Miscellaneous. A few random items that came up. Why didn't anyone check on the cat? We had no reason to. Sonny, the cat, was not extremely gregarious, so when they video called during quarantine, it made sense not to see her. We did not go visit anyone during the pandemic, so we had no idea how things were going to be. Before the epidemic, he was fine, as was his house and cat. I'm not sure how we were expected to know any of this was happening or how we could have stopped it. I'm sorry I let an innocent cat down, and I'll be forever guilty for not being able to help her. What are the chances of having 10 boys, three of whom can quit everything and move to the other side of the country? There weren't always 10 boys. Regarding their dropping everything to come, I'm not sure what answer you want. That they recognized how chaotic the situation was that their spouses could function without them for a few days. That they could take a day off from work and come. That their sibling requested for help and they were able to assist. I honestly don't know what you expect from me with such questions. Why didn't you see it coming? There have to be signs. You would have to ask their family, as you're aware that I am not on good terms with them at the moment. Ted maintains he didn't observe anything, but his perception may have been skewed due to their proximity, and he may have been unaware of it or assumed it was usual. So that's where my life is right now. I'm exhausted and depressed and things are still bad, but I have something to look forward to. A really wonderful therapist who keeps reassuring me that I'm well and secure and is teaching me how to be normal again. Sorry for the lengthy update, please know that I appreciate all of your compassion and taking the time to read about my follies. I wish you all the best and know you'll always have a buddy here. When I'm ready to go back out into the world, I'd like to have more kind people in my life, including Ellie, Ted and Tortilla the cat. Edit. I apologize for not being more clear about the 10 brothers thing. Apparently, I may have caused some confusion. I intended to add that there weren't always 10 sons. It is neither my family's or my tale to share. According to what I know, they had three sisters. Two of them died when they were young due to health concerns. This explains why there is a gap between one and eight, followed by Ted and Ash. The other one is slightly more complex. She used to rank between fourth and fifth. Yes, I am aware that they had a large number of children, nonetheless they continue to reject contraception. Sorry about the confusion. Update 3. Tokyo Drift. Hello everyone. It's been almost two months since the disaster began, and I've just received several letters and comments requesting an update. As is customary, the majority of them were pleasant and beautiful. There are of course, exceptions, but at this stage in my life, I'm used to them and believe they're just part of online culture. First and foremost, I apologize for the delayed update. I know a lot of people are curious about what's happened to Ted's family, but I simply wanted some time to comprehend everything. But here I am, telling you yet another sad part of this story so you can all be at rest. I'd also want to greet the Facebook community. I appreciate folks telling me where they're coming from, because I had no idea the power of Reddit until I wrote my first post. Anyway, Ted begged for some time apart. He is going through a lot of things and has a lot of feelings, which are exacerbated by my presence. He carries a lot of guilt and opening so many closets and confronting skeletons is a lot to ask of anyone. We are not officially divorced, but we are not looking for a new home together either. 
We are still in the process of selling our old home, so he has been staying there while I have been staying with my parents. I'm not sure what will happen once the sale of our house is completed, or what he intends to do, but I promised him space, so there's that. He did give me permission to inform you all because, despite some unpleasant messages and comments, the most of you are extremely kind and helpful. Here's Ted's updated family tree. Counting the sisters, B stands for brother of Ted, and S stands for sister. B number one, doctor with some type of military background. Wife, three kids. B number two, surgeon, wife, two dogs and a bearded dragon. B number three, engineer, fiance, and dog. B number four, teacher and researcher, wife, one kid. S number one, B number five, works in A8, not sure of details, wife. B number six, doctor, single and ready to mingle. B number seven, chef, businessman, wife, one kid. B number eight, car sales, wife, three kids. Number two and number three, B number nine, Ted's ex-wife and cat. B number 10, Ash. I didn't just throw in the sisters to add some spice to my chaotic scenario. I'm sorry to disappoint, I didn't count them previously because, well, I don't want to offend anyone who has lost a family member, but I'm going by what I know about that family. All three sisters were born and died before Ted was even conceived. He's never mentioned having sisters in his life, therefore he just says he has brothers. To me and him, he does not have any sisters. You people are wild. The theories you developed, some more accurate than others, ranged from entirely rational to clearly delusional. However, based on what you and I know about this family, insanity runs in the family. No, they were not all murdered. Sisters number two and three were twins who died from a congenital defect, my apologies for stating genetic. I'm not sure why so many people assumed it was something only for women. Ted just knows that their lungs were not properly developed, or something like. As you are aware, I am not on speaking terms with his family and hence cannot ask any further questions. They died in the hospital a few weeks after birth, so none of the brothers could have harmed them. Sister number one died in a motorcycle accident caused by one of the brothers driving while intoxicated and underage. Why didn't I simply say it outright? Because it is none of my or your concern. It wasn't relevant to our circumstance, and I honestly believe that people deserve privacy. I'm not going to tell you which brother it was, so you can choose whichever fits your story best. Many people have asked about the nasty secrets that their mother forgave them for. I'll post the ones that I have permission to share. I'm not going to reveal which brother did what, simply number 7, because I've already disclosed it so there's no use in hiding it now. I simply copied and pasted the comment I made then. There are 10 brothers altogether. Brothers 1 through 4 are the classic older brothers, golden children, straight-A students. Brothers age 5 and under were used to trying to meet the expectations established by the oldest 4. It was expected that every one of them excelled in a sport, received good grades, attended college on a scholarship, since paying for 10 children's college is difficult, and had a career. Brother number 7 did not want to. He is a great man. He simply felt it was unfair that his life was determined by competing against his brothers. So, after he graduated from high school, he stated that he was studying overseas to become a chef, but that his scholarship would only pay partial tuition and not room and board. His parents were ecstatic that their son was studying overseas to become a well-known worldwide chef. They said okay, as long as you maintain good grades and cook us your specialty foods when you visit for vacations and such. So he relocated to New York with four roommates and pretended to have an international life. He doesn't use social media often, so he didn't need to prove anything. He merely had to make sure to phone his folks at times that made sense given the time difference. He didn't have to video call them because technology hadn't advanced far by then. He just made up some great stories to share during the holidays. He retained the money he received from his parents to pay for tuition and boarding and invested it in something that turned out to be quite profitable. So he moved back to the West Coast and announced that he was now managing eateries. It all came to light when one of the oldest brother's kids expressed her desire to attend the same school as brother number seven. She requested him to take her there and show her around. By that point, he had enough money that there weren't many penalties, but he still cooks Thanksgiving and Christmas meals since he cooks well. So here's what I know because Ted, their mother, or the brother in issue informed me they did it with no ramifications from their parents. Stealing and totaling at least two cars, same brother both times. Stealing a car, different brother. Leaving grandma alone for the week when they were supposed to care for her. Stealing and selling things from the house. Other brothers getting into fights that ended up with police involvement. Getting into fights that did not end up with police involvement but did end up with a trip to the hospital skipping school events like senior trips and pocketing the money, public nudity, 
public indecency and public urination. I guess it does run in the family. One stalking incident ended up with a restraining order. There was plenty of underage drinking and driving under the influence. Where is the father? I last saw him in an urn in the living room of their mother's house, so hopefully he's still there. Growing up, he was an ass, a deeply chauvinist and abusive father and husband. He was a decent grandfather to his grandchildren, but if you have anything to say about it, bring it up with them. Why would you expose your children to such a nasty person? I don't have my own children. Ted's parents were, and still are, quite traditional, with looks being the most important thing to them. All they desired was a perfect family, complete with proud sons and lovely daughters. I'm not rationalizing anything, but their daughter's deaths had a significant impact on them and their families. Why did they have two more children after all that happened? They desperately desired another daughter and tried two more times before being unable to produce any more children. I'm not sure if they would have tried again, or if her inability to produce further children exacerbated the situation. What happened to Ashley? I do not know. I'd like to claim I don't know and don't care, but I do care as a human being. After therapy, I'm a little more empathetic, and I know he's sick. So I care and hope he is okay, able to recover and go forward. I simply want it would happen far away from me. I'm not sure if he's still institutionalized, but I have it on good authority that he's staying away from me. So that's it for that family. I hope this answers all of your questions concerning them. As always, a big thanks to B number 6 for being fantastic. He has been really supportive throughout everything, and in general, he is a nice person who is still single and looking to meet new people. When I told him I was updating again, he made sure I emphasized it. So if anyone on the West Coast is looking for a gorgeous doctor with a crazy dysfunctional family, he's the one. Tortilla has sincerely appreciated all of the love, affection, and appreciation. As I indicated in a previous remark, I apologize for not paying the cat tax, but right now I am not comfortable sharing images of anything, including tortilla, with anyone. Nothing against you personally, just feeling uneasy after everything that has transpired. So I really apologize for that. Since I'm evading taxes, I'll tell you she's a black cat. She's named tortilla because I'm not very good at cooking, and the first time I made Ted tacos, I completely forgot the tortillas were in the oven, and they got fully burned. As for me, everything sucks and will continue to suck for a while. Boo, that's just life. I had to quit my job after quitting my previous work, therefore I'm currently unemployed and freeloading at my parents. But my father claims he doesn't mind, he just wants me to be okay, and I love him for that. It's good to have my sisters around, plus there are more kitties to play with. Tortilla, I am still in treatment, which is about all I can do with my life right now. On the plus side, I'm sure none of these cats have ever been groomed as frequently as they have in the last two weeks, so they're all exceptionally shiny and attractive. That's it for today. Sorry for the lengthy read. Update 4. Return to P-Town. I've written numerous updates over the course of the year, some while joyful, some while sad, and some while drunk, but I opted not to upload them in order to give you a suitable conclusion to the story. But I recognize that real life does not have a proper ending. There will always be more going on. Hopefully, this will be the end of it for all of us. And I will be able to go on, while you will be satisfied with how things have turned out thus far. I really hope you do. I also hope that writing this and giving it to you offers me the closure I need. I'm writing this update now because I'm in a good enough state to open up and relieve my guilt over the lack of updates. It's quite wonderful of most of you to check on me during the year. It's incredible to me that it's been over a year and there are still new letters and good comments in my inbox. I apologize for not responding sooner but please know that I read each and every comment, and it warms my heart to know that there are so many wonderful people out there wishing a random stranger kindness. I'll admit that part of me is always frightened to write an update. Part of it stems from the real-life consequences of putting things online, such as being identified, which I have experienced. The second aspect is the finality of it. It's strange, but I feel like if I don't tell you about it, I can simply pretend it's not happening. It's not really healthy, as my therapist has pointed out. So I'm putting on my cat hair covered big girl pants and confronting the reality. It's crazy to believe that this all began just a few days into the new year, and how close we are to doing it again. I recall spending New Year's Eve cuddled up on the couch with Ted and Tortilla, hoping that 2021 would be full of adventures and excitement. I guess I should watch my wishes for the future year. I'm not even sure what I'll do that day. Perhaps I'll pack Tortilla and we'll go on an adventure, as I don't intend to sit on the couch and reminisce over the past year. I can say though, that it was a very comfortable couch, and I miss it tremendously. I adore Ted. I believe a part of me will always adore him. 
I've spent such a lengthy and vital part of my life with him that it feels strange to be without him in my daily life. Short story. He asked for a divorce, so there you have it. It was as amicable a divorce as possible given our circumstances. We cried during the entire process. He called to ask for my pardon. I begged him not to leave me, but as much as it hurt it was necessary for him to recuperate from everything that had happened. We are still buddies. We've been best friends for so long that even if that part of our relationship is locked off, we're still there for each other. I know you don't want to hear about my heartbreak. You probably want the latest gossip and juicy information. So I will give the facts I have. Just keep in mind that now that we've parted, I'm not privy to many details. I'll divide things into sections to make it simpler to read, but not in chronological order, just to keep things organized. My ex's family, B number 8, wife, three children, fish, and a cat. I haven't heard from them since the divorce, but I know they previously adopted a kitty named Bob. B number 7, wife and child. No idea. I haven't heard from them. I haven't asked. B hash 6 with his girlfriend. He is no longer single and ready to socialize. I'm overjoyed for him, and his new girlfriend is genuinely amazing. She is a fellow Redditor who has read the Pate saga and still loves him, despite his dysfunctional family. I've met them several times this year and she really is nice. Of course, they have their ups and downs, as well as conflicts with the other brothers, but they are doing well overall. B number 6 actually came to see me after Ted sought for a divorce. He hugged me and informed me that I would always be his little sister, regardless of whether I was married or not. It's been extremely heartbreaking to lose my husband and half of what I regarded to be my family, but I did get to keep a brother because I only have sisters. B hash 5 and his wife. He never liked me, and I finally figured out why. He's not very fond of Ted. As you are aware, the brothers were not particularly nice growing up, and it appears that number 5 was the worst of the bunch, and he disliked it when Ted stood up to him or defended Ash. He hasn't liked him since they were younger. I have had no interaction with him, nor do I intend to. B number 4, wife, child. They have remained largely unchanged, they were always friendly. B number 4 made certain that Ash was on all of the do not adopt lists at every shelter, shop, or vet in the area where they live. He claims that even if Ash does well for the rest of his life, he will not risk another cat or other animal going through the same ordeal if his mental health deteriorates. So at least I left that family with the confidence that future cats would be safe from Ash, which made me feel a little better. There's always the potential he'll get astray or someone would adopt one for him, but B number 4 told me that he'd do all in his ability to prevent it from happening again. B number 3, his now wife and their dog got married when the saga began. They were only engaged at the time. It was a lovely ceremony, but I did not go despite the fact that both the bride and groom invited me and stated I should come because I was family. Ted asked me to come, but I didn't want to destroy any more family photos. I did however attend via Zoom, which is how I knew it was enjoyable. B hash 2, his wife, two pets, and a dragon. B number 2 was quite helpful when everything transpired and was among the first to take action. He apologized extensively to me, both for the initial pressure to let Ash move in and for what happened subsequently. He felt particularly sorry for his role in his brother's mental health. I thanked him for the first two apologies and informed him that the third one was not mine to accept. He was understanding and stated that he would concentrate on improving his family's ties and that it was unfair that I should bear the brunt of the consequences for something that was not my fault. After the divorce, he contacted me and said that if I needed anything, he would be there for me. Overall, it was a wonderful message and I know he's also in therapy now, which is fantastic. B hash 1, his wife, and three children. As you know, B number 1 was the most offended by the entire scenario because it affected one of his daughters. Last you heard, they had requested me to remain away and give them some room. But his oldest daughter contacted me. She's a darling who told me she misses her life before everything happened. I did not inquire about what her parents told her, but I felt they had to tell her some version of events because she is old enough to ask the correct questions. He did not press charges, but they moved. Fortunately for daughter number one, they moved to the East Coast, where she discovered an incredible culinary program that she is extremely enthused about. Daughter number two, according to her sister, mother, and therapist, is doing quite well. Apparently, she never had much interaction with Ash outside of large family gatherings with others. He was taking his anger out on her because she is the spitting image of her father, not so much for her as an individual, but for who she represents and the fact that she is a woman. I'll go into that later. She is still in treatment, but she is very irritated about it, claiming that it has nothing to do with her and that she is distraught about having to move and leave all of her friends. 
Overall, B number one's family is safe and adjusting to life on the East Coast, although they continue to keep a distance from me. They haven't liked the weather so far, but I have told daughter number one that she is welcome to come anytime. B number one's wife and I are friendly enough that she would let it. B number one and I haven't talked since everything went down. All communications have gone through his wife and daughters. The wicked way, from the West. Some days, just for fun, I'll go into our SLJ nomal and tell myself that mine wasn't as horrible as others. I'll see some and wish I had one whose worst behavior was to wear white to my wedding. We were never best friends, but she was not always mean to me. Living on the opposite side of the country created a barrier in our relationship that I believe we were both comfortable with. We didn't have much interaction with one other, and we were fine with it. She had so many other dills around who raised her grandchildren that I wasn't as significant to her. I continued to call her on her birthdays and anniversaries, and she always invited me over for the holidays. Whenever we went over the holidays, the house was always so full of people that I was just one more or one less, and I was fine with that. I believe that's when my doormating with this family began. I tried to be as helpful as possible and would do whatever to help, but it ultimately backfired on me. I believe the most time we ever spent together was during our wedding preparations. Our wedding was never significant to Ted or me. All we wanted was to be together. Our parents on the other hand, were eager to have a large wedding. I'm the first of my sisters to marry, and given the age difference between Ted and his elder brothers, there hadn't been a huge occasion like this in a while. I have absolutely no regrets about marrying Ted. I could do without the large wedding though. I wish we could have married at the courthouse with just the two of us. Or perhaps gone to Vegas and been married by Elvis. I'm not sure if they still do that, but it seems just as, if not more memorable than a large 200-person wedding. I recall how happy she was when we eventually agreed on the big wedding. It was as if for the first time, I wasn't simply another dill in the pile. It's foolish, but it felt good to feel that I was finally allowed into the inner circle, even if it came at the expense of a lavish wedding. I attempted to involve her in the process as much as possible. With ten sons, I assumed she didn't have many opportunities to do female things. She was sweet to me back then, possibly to get her way, and I was too naive to see. I stayed at the Golden Dill for a bit after that, I believe, until another granddaughter was born. Then I was relieved to be out of the spotlight, returning to our normal coexistence. It was exhausting to be on her side, with all of the expectations that come with it. It's weird to go back and remember how much I wanted her to like me, and now I'd do anything to keep her unaware of my presence. After Ash was admitted to a psych facility, she did everything she could to tear me down. I went to see her, along with the rest of the family, for a time, but eventually made apologies with some of them. Of certainly not with her. I saw her once, when she arrived with some of the others to pack up Ash's place. She went to my parents' house solely to yell at me, which was terrible. The worst part was that she timed it so perfectly. My parents were at work, and my sisters were either at work or school. I was the only one sobbing on the other side of the door. I heard the doorbell and rushed to open it, only to see her. She didn't even try to be nice and just threw it all on me. She brought up everything I had ever done to her and her family. She told me I was a failure as a wife and that she hoped the divorce would ruin me. She stated she would make sure her son grabbed everything from me and that she would not stop until I was impoverished. She stated she was glad I was barren because she couldn't bear the thought of mixing her blood with mine. She said so many horrible things that day, but the last one was the most memorable. Ted and I were never trying to have children. But we weren't trying not to. We assumed we were steady enough that if it was meant to be, it would happen, but it never did. Does it make me an evil human being to be grateful that my parents' neighbors contacted the cops and removed her from of the property? My sister discovered me sitting on the floor, crying with tortilla. She contacted Ted and I believe he heard the account from B number 5, who drove her. I never saw him. I haven't heard anything from her since. I'm not sure what Ted told her or what she told him. I only know that she has left me alone since that day and I am grateful for that. Ted is the universe's most decent ex-husband. I could tell you a thousand things about Ted or none at all. It feels strange not to be with him, but I try to respect his wants and wishes. As you are aware, he sought a divorce from me on the grounds that, I cannot do this to you. I can never forgive myself for placing you in this situation. I do not want to expose you to my family again and allow them to damage you. I was irritated because he was making decisions for me without considering what I wanted for myself. But, after many long therapy sessions I realized that while he claimed to be doing it to protect me, it was actually to protect himself. Or, at the very least, to alleviate his guilt. Perhaps not having me around made him feel as if nothing had happened. Or he honestly believed that this was the best option for me. 
It really sucks because I've always thought about what was best for us as a whole, not just myself and him. However, his solution was not to have a team. Some days I wake up loathing his name and shadow, while others I simply stare at my phone and contemplating phoning him. Sometimes I lose that battle and end up calling him. He always responds and assures me that he is there for me. Anyway, we sold our house and he moved out. He temporarily relocated to the West Coast to address family difficulties while his divorce was being conducted. He returned because his job was waiting for him, and he enjoys it. I'm not sure if I should be grateful that he's still living in the city that was once our home, or angry that he's ruined an entire city I like. It's unfortunate that every area I want to visit is packed with memories of him. Perhaps it is time for me to relocate and begin anew somewhere where no one is aware of my dark, tragic background. I'll tell you more about Ted's travels on the East Coast later. This section contains life updates. Some individuals expressed concern for him and sent him well wishes via comments and messages. I pass them forward, and he thanks me. I'll copy and paste a portion of the update I made but did not post the day he returned to town and invited me to meet. This is about your Redditors. I apologize in advance, it wasn't a good day. I never used Reddit much. I'm wondering where my life would be without you now. I probably would have allowed his family continue to doormat me, and who knows, maybe I'd be with Sonny right now, and Ash would have gotten all of his life's ambitions fulfilled. To this day, I still receive texts wishing us both well. A part of me wishes I didn't have to share you with him. Why does he deserve your best wishes while I'm the one who ended up alone? You are bigger and better people than me. I did tell him that you hoped he was okay. I'll admit that I told him partially to hurt him and make him feel guilty. Maybe I'll regret it later, but I simply needed him to feel anything other than sympathy for me. Do you know what the worst part is? He laughed. Even though it was a dead man's chuckle, I was concerned by the sound. It isn't fair that he gets to chuckle. He thanked you and expressed hope that one day he will be the man you believed he was or could be. He also apologized for disappointing you all and acknowledged that this is not the ending you had hoped for. Although some of you wished for this conclusion from the beginning, I'm not sure if you've changed your mind after all of the updates or if you still believe I should leave him. He has always preferred to be in control, so he left me alone. Aside from that, Ted is as good as he could be. He has good and terrible days, just like I do. We meet on a regular basis to check on each other. He informs me about his life and I tell him how I am doing. After his mother paid a visit to my parents' place, I moved out. I haven't asked him to my new apartment and I don't sure I want to. I believe having a house without memories of him or his family for the first time in a decade is just what I need right now. Tortilla misses him, but I try to convince myself that she understands my pain. I don't know where to start. And Ash was first committed following his dispute with his brothers, and B numbers 3, 4 and 8 arrived to assist sort things out. He stayed for a few weeks. During his visit, he repeatedly requested to see Ted, but he never did. However, he did once write him a letter. At the time, I didn't want to know what it stated, but I eventually asked Ted about it. He stated that he had written to tell him to stop asking to see him, that he needed to prioritize himself and his life over Ash for once, and that he should stop putting Ash's wants ahead of his own. After a few weeks, B number 3 arranged for his relocation to the West Coast. I'm not sure whether he was transported to another facility or released into their custody. Once that was completed, which took about two months, their mother, B number 5, and B number 7 arrived to pack up his flat and legally relocate him back west. As previously stated, I am unsure of the exact timeline, but he eventually moved in with their mother. B number 2 was in charge of overseeing his therapy, and I trust he will continue to do so. It was difficult for Ted to come over and express himself to his family. He first met with his brothers. I'm not sure if everyone was there, but based on what Ted told me, I believe the most involved were. B number 3 told them some of what he had discussed with his doctors while on the East Coast. He had treatment for a psychotic episode. I believe he's been in treatment since then. I'm not sure what the precise diagnosis is, but they discussed a lot of topics. They discussed their background and how their bullying affected Ash, how Ted's protectiveness fostered an unhealthy emotional relationship, and a few other topics came up. I'm not sure if these are the conclusions they reached, if they were told by Ash's therapist, or how they arrived, but this is what Ted told me when he returned. It was strange listening to him talk about it. He was so disconnected, as if he were speaking about someone else's family. But I suppose that's his method of digesting things. I do not know. Many of you have wondered what kind of bullying they may have done to cause him to behave this way. Ted answered a few of those questions for me. To maintain consistency, I will not tell you who did what. As usual, you can use your own brother to match your story. 
Just be aware that, while some brothers are contrite and regretful for their actions, it appears that others are not. Many of you also made suggestions about the type of torturing they did, with some being more accurate than others. Apart from your regular standardized bullying of punching, humiliating, mocking, tricking and insulting, there was also locking him in cabinets, stealing his clothes, leaving him outside all night long, locking all bathrooms so he'd have to wet himself, threatening with a variety of items and weapons, leaving him at places and making him walk miles to their house in a variety of weather, putting him in diapers, antagonizing him, tying him up and dragging him on ATVs through I could continue, but you get the picture. I understand that some individuals don't get along with their siblings, and that bullying and sibling rivalry exist, but it looked so wicked when he described it. What could he have done to deserve this? I don't understand it. It doesn't excuse his actions, but it explains some of it. His dislike of women stems from a similar source. The common assumption is that he blames his mother for failing to protect him from all of this, which reinforces his perception of women as weak and useless. If his mother couldn't keep him safe from his own brothers, who could? I suppose his brothers didn't assist him with that growing up because they would isolate him from any girls that shown an interest in him. That's how his emotional bond with Ted began. He was the only one who stood up and defended him, but we all know how it ended, for now and hopefully forever. Ash is staying in the West. I am sorry I do not have more definitive answers for you. I'm sure many of you expected them, but I can't bring myself to ask any more questions. While this all began, while I was fresh out of school, I retained two pairs of sneakers from the PE event. I threw out the majority of the rest, but those two pairs, the first pair is irrelevant to you and the second were the first things I purchased with my own money from my very first internship while still in school, represented the very first step. As a result shoes have contributed to my independence. Having to stop both of my jobs, move back in with my parents, and lose Ted sucked, and all I could think about were those shoes stowed in a box and how unjust it was that I had lost everything the shoes represented. I'm steadily rebuilding my life. The first steps will be to move into my new apartment and get a new job. I guess I'll wait and see what the future has in store for Tortilla and me. I haven't worn them since they were peed on, but maybe I will sometime when I feel more like myself. Happy holidays Reddit. I'm not sure what mine will be like, but I hope yours is full of light and joy. Much love from my tattered heart, Ellie and Tortilla. The cat update, 5 PE and tell no tales. It's been a long since I was here. I even quit posting unpublished updates since I didn't want to worry about life or anything. How are you all doing? How is your new year going so far? I hope everyone has been happy and healthy, that all of your kitties have been petted and that your bladders are empty. I'll keep this update as short as possible. I've received a few comments and letters indicating that I write too much and take too long to get to the point, and I apologize for that. Although it is not my responsibility to keep you updated on my life, I am writing to express my gratitude for the outpouring of love and support from many Redditors, as well as those who have inquired about my well-being and requested updates. So, if it's too long for you, feel free to quit reading at any time. My story has no bearing on your life except for entertainment, so you can remain or leave and I'll be none the wiser. I last posted just before the holidays, and I'll admit that my holiday preparations were not the best in retrospect. I know I mentioned in my last update that I wouldn't sit on the couch and wallow in self-pity, but you can guess what I did. I was honestly not in the mood to celebrate. My family is very into Christmas and pleasure and joy and I didn't want to dampen the spirit. So I told my father I was spending it with a friend who had just lost her husband. She traveled across the state to be with his folks, and I stayed at home with Tortilla, watching movies. Ted contacted me on Christmas Day and for the first time, I did not respond. Are you all incredibly proud of me? I knew you would be, after so many of you agreed that I should cut them off entirely. Please accept my baby steps. Even after everything that had transpired, I couldn't bring myself to give up on my best buddy. He texted me later in the day to check in and see if I was okay, claiming he had seen my sister's photos on Facebook and noted I wasn't there. Should I ask my sisters to block him? He loves them, and they love him. He was a fantastic guy before everything happened, and he's still doing his best now. I'm not sure if it's how I write, when I write, or if I'm influenced by our relationship, but Ted isn't as bad as some of you make him out to be. He is also going through a really terrible experience, and having to confront everything his family did is difficult. I waited on his text for a few hours, contemplating how to respond, and honestly came up empty-handed. I wasn't doing well, but overall, he's the one who knows me best. Our 10 years together were not wasted. We didn't end our relationship because we were no longer in love, but because it was best for us both. In some ways, you have a unique opportunity to read my updates. 
You are not the ones whose life were shattered and you moved from having a loving family to being absolutely alone. I had my family and you to rely on, but Ted didn't. Because of all of this, some of his brothers have developed a stronger dislike for him. He lost his greatest buddy and younger brother. He has lost his partner. He lost Tortilla as well, and while it's a relief he also lost his mother. You only know my side of the story and the morsels I share with you so it's easy to villainize him and think of him as a monster for hurting me. But he is still a human. He was also deeply hurt throughout the event and he is human and bound to make mistakes. Even though I don't think our divorce will ever be considered a mistake by him, I ended up simply responding with something like, wasn't up for a party, so just stayed in with Tortilla. Merry Christmas. And I guess he realized something was wrong and came to my park. He is familiar with the general area where I live as well as the gorgeous park that I frequent, and he invited me to meet him, which I accepted. Yes, you can be less proud of my minor accomplishment that day, but again, baby steps. We spoke for several hours. I had no idea he was spending Christmas alone. Otherwise, I would have preferred to spend it with him, or at the absolute least, invite him to my parents. Many of you have urged that cutting him off completely is the greatest option, but I disagree. I might alter my mind later, but for the time being, I believe we still need each other a little. Every day, I think I need him a little less, but that day, I needed him, and sometimes he needs me as well. I'd like to believe we can be friends, but I realize that in the long run, it might not be feasible. He'll eventually find another partner, and they're unlikely to like me. Or perhaps we will grow apart. Maybe one day I'll loathe him for what happened. But for the time being, he has benefited me in ways that others cannot. It may sound ridiculous from my perspective, but I don't believe anyone else genuinely understands who I am right now. I am not the same person I was before everything happened. I'm no longer the same person I was a year ago. Going through this with his family affected both of us dramatically, and not everyone understands why I'm not comfortable bringing children to the restroom or why I had to leave sick when my boss brought me sunflowers on International Women's Day. I believe we both lost aspects of ourselves that were perhaps a little too naive, and we've both matured in ways neither of us imagined, but which have helped to ground us. I've had a very fortunate and protected existence, and while I've lost part of the brightness that once filled me, I believe this new shade has helped me connect with people more and understand their hardships in a more empathic manner. Or at the very least, I would want to believe so. Perhaps that is just what going to therapy accomplishes for you. In that case, I strongly advise everyone, P or not, to go to therapy. Overall, I believe we are both doing a little better. Tortilla is doing well. Aside from a minor health scare, she is doing well as usual. Our new apartment has a lot of windows, which means there are plenty of sunny spots, which she is loving. Ted lost communication with the majority of his family and is currently in limited contact with B4 and B6. So I don't really have anything to say about Ash or the rest of the brothers, except for B6, who's quite sorry that Ted is keeping his distance from him, especially because he has cut off almost everyone. But he says he understands and will be there for him when he is ready. It was said several times that what was previously referred to as bullying was actually abuse, and I believe it is crucial to utilize that term when characterizing their childhood. I believe that part of the difficulty that led the House of Cards to collapse was the dismissive attitude of everyone involved, even Ted and Ash, who dismissed it as boys will be boys. Brothers are like that. Or simply I thought it was normal. I believe that if any of the spouses or I had known the scope of things in their youth, we might have made quite different decisions. Of course, my ex mill bears a lot of responsibility for it, but I suppose we've all learnt from it. I don't think I'm ready to start dating yet. I believe I need to learn to be alone first. I've been with Ted since college, and it's been quite some time. I don't think I know how to perform first aid anymore, but I'm sure I'll be able to Google it when I get there. It's been strange adjusting to alone. I don't want to call it loneliness because sometimes it's pleasant, you know? I'll finish a book and close it, and the place will be quiet, not eerie, but comforting. I've had to learn a lot, which has made me realize how much I rely on others to assist me with tasks that I could always handle alone. I replaced a tire for the first time. It was a terrifying encounter because my tire popped on the highway, but I made it. After losing a bunch of plants, I realized that different plants take different care, but I now have a small basil plant that is thriving well. I discovered that I dislike action films. The fast pace and continual pressure do not appeal to me. I learned how to cook shrimp. Ted is allergic so we didn't have any at home. Pro tip, remember to devein your shrimp. I also miss certain aspects of my time with Ted. I had to drive myself to the emergency room after missing a carrot with a knife, and I believe hospitals should offer valet parking. Tortilla had a health scare, 
and sitting alone in the waiting room was quite unpleasant. The death anniversary of a childhood buddy passed, and he was not there to comfort me. I likewise despise mopping and am forced to do it myself. That's about it. I don't think I've seen Ted since Christmas, though we do text and contact each other occasionally. We're learning to be apart without giving up all of our support at once. We're still healing. I'm still healing, but I can confidently say that I can see the bright side now, when previously it was just a matter of taking each day as it came. I am not sure if that makes sense. Ted's birthday is coming up. I don't believe I'll go see him, but I'll ask his buddies to make sure he is not alone. I've considered adopting an elderly cat for him. He's always had strong feelings for them, and I believe it would be beneficial for him, but I don't want to go too far. What do you all think? Finally, I'd want to thank you for your ongoing support and best wishes. You actually are a fantastic community that exemplifies the best of human nature. Of course, Reddit has its dark corners and unpleasant people, but the vast majority of you are such a powerful support system without even knowing me or the many others you have assisted. I'm simply thinking that maybe the internet isn't so horrible. I'll make an effort to repay and spread all of the generosity I've gotten from you all, and perhaps, one Redditor at a time, we might leave this place a little better than we found it. Right now, I believe this is as good a last update as any, a somewhat happy conclusion with a promising future. I'm not sure, maybe I'll surprise you all like Gilmore Girls and offer you a year in the life somewhere in the future, but for now, I can assure you that everything will be fine. Head pets for everyone who want them, intended for cats, but I don't discriminate by species, and my love for everyone from my repairing heart, Ellie and Tortilla. Update 6, Return of the P-Man. Hello nice individuals. How are you? Almost a year has passed, and I hope we've all gotten older and wiser. It's endearing to know that even after all this time, people are still following me and sending me encouraging messages and comments. Also, thank you to everybody who reported me to Reddit Care. I had no idea they offered that service. I hope it came from a position of care and concern. I believe the story was shared on TikTok at some point, so hello to everyone who arrived from there. At this time, I expect AOL chat groups or Yahoo answers to appear. The new 20s are kicking my ass, and not in a particularly good way. I can't wait for this decade to end. A Redditor referred to my previous update as a holiday special, which made me laugh. I don't think they meant it kindly, but it made me laugh because I am a total sucker for the Hallmark channel. So here I am again, following the holidays. For my enemies and those who don't want to sit through a half-hour rant, here is the TLDR. I bought a robot mop, my basil died, things began to seem normal, my ex-husband attempted suicide, and I'm now back at my parents' house. I've highlighted the bits referenced in the TLDR so you can jump to the relevant parts. But now for a more detailed account of events, which may not be in chronological order. My life-saving robot mop and my dying basil, at the recommendation of several Redditors, I purchased a steam mop. It did help at first, but I still had to go through the motions of cleaning, and the fact that the floor was still damp and my socks were wet is what concerns me about mopping. So, uh, at the recommendation of several Redditors, I purchased a robot mop. I had a room, but I had no idea they also created mop versions. It's perfect, and I adore it. I run her while I'm out for the day, and when I return home, the floors are freshly cleaned and dried. It's the greatest feeling in the world, my small basil plant died. I believe it is my fault because I relocated it from its previous location in the kitchen, where it received more light, but it is now dead. I did create a delicious pasta salad with the rest of it, oro with cherry tomatoes, mozzarella balls, olive oil, salt and basil. Very simple and wonderful. I was given a few little rose plants and managed to kill them all within a few months, so I gave up on living vegetation. My internal monologue ramblings are returning to some sense of normalcy, life sucks, and then you die. One of my sisters has always been hooked to that statement and I believe the beauty of it is that it can be interpreted in a variety of ways. She sees it as a lesson not to dwell on the negative, because you never know when you'll die, but right now I feel it a little more physically. I suppose the romanticized phrase when it rains it pours stems from a similar idea. I went on a date set up by a buddy of mine with his co-worker, and it was awkward. I'm not sure if I've always been this awkward, if first dates are inherently awful, or if we just didn't click, but I spent the entire evening feeling fight or flight. The guy was great, perhaps we should have done something less formal than dinner. I haven't been on a first date in years, I suppose most people currently like coffee and I should have followed suit, or maybe I wasn't prepared yet. My new, not so new job, which I obtained after everything happened, is wonderful. My supervisor no longer gives me flowers as gifts. I'm not sure if he was smart and noticed what occurred last year and took the hint, or if someone mentioned it, but now, when everyone else gets flowers, I get lamps. I know that seems strange, but I enjoy lamps and light-up items. In the last year, 
He has given me a cute kitten nightlight that I like in as well as some fairy lights and one of those Himalayan rock salt lamps. He's a nice guy, and I appreciate his efforts. My co-workers are wonderful and the work we perform is both enjoyable and rewarding, which is something I did not have before. I used to work two jobs, one satisfying and one to pay the bills. It's crazy to have one that does both, and it makes me feel like I wasted so much time with my prior one. So there's a silver lining to everything. Tortilla is doing well. She is now forced to eat prescription food and is really unhappy about it. Even though it's been months, winter is always difficult for her because she becomes extra fluffy, which bothers her. So it's time to do extra brushing and de-shedding. If you have long-haired pets, I recommend the Furminator, but Amazon has cheaper choices. She's getting older, so I do my best to keep her comfortable. One of my sisters got a kitten, and we look after him when she is away. Tortilla simply adores him. Matcha, the kitten, dislikes all of the grooming she gives him and pretends not to like her, but if he falls asleep, he will go cuddle with her. If she wakes up before, he'll flee. I'm rambling, perhaps because I'm not sure where to begin or what to say. It's also a little alarming because I know certain individuals are keeping an eye on me through this account. I don't mind if they do but it still seems strange, like when you know someone is watching you from afar, I'm not sure whether that makes sense to you people. But yeah. Anyway, when I'm feeling particularly masochistic, I'll browse the comments on sites where the Pia Man saga has been discussed. Most of you on my own threads are extremely nice and helpful, but outside of my own virtual walls, individuals express harsher opinions. As previously stated, it is both masochistic and harmful, and I'm aware of this. My therapist is aware of this, but it also serves to anchor me and allow me to see things from new perspectives. For example, someone branded me insane for being so infatuated with cats. I hadn't realized it, but a large amount of my updates are about cats and their well-being. This is because I genuinely enjoy cats. That person claimed I displayed more empathy for cats than I did for Ash, my in-laws, or even Ted. And yes, you could call me sociopathic, but domesticated animals in general have little control in what happens in their life. We as pet owners, make decisions for them and strive to make the best ones we can. But in the case of Sunny, I will always feel more pity for her than for anyone else since she was helpless. There was no other choice for her, no safe haven, and no one to advocate for her. Even if you remove the sentimental aspect of my attachment to cats, it was still terrible from a humane sense, and there is a reason why animal cruelty charges were contemplated. Other responses suggested that I was over-victimizing myself, that what I went through was insignificant and that I was overly dramatic, which I may be. They claimed the genuine victims were X, Y, or Z. I believe that everyone involved in this event is a victim in some manner, but being a victim in your own story does not preclude becoming a villain in someone else's. Take my XMIL as an example. She has received the least amount of sympathy in what I have read, although her husband was AOS, an abusive parent and husband. I know her upbringing was less than ideal, and she has a lot of unresolved trauma from the deaths of her daughters. Does this excuse her behavior? No. Does it provide some explanation? Maybe. Does that make up for all of the harm she caused? Definitely not. Ash was a victim of an extremely brutal childhood, but part of the reason this took everyone off guard and things went downhill so quickly was that he was very well put together. Or, at the very least, he was fantastic at managing or disguising his emotions. He has an engineering degree from a reputable university, a solid employment and a fulfilling life after graduation. Everything went down with the pandemic and isolation. I'm not sure, and I've thought about it a lot, but what would have occurred if there hadn't been a pandemic? Wouldn't Ash have snapped? Could something else have prompted him? Would anyone else have unlocked the skeleton closet? Imaginary what-ifs are their own ADV. I've imagined so many various lives, with joyful, sad and tragic endings. I know it's not a good idea to focus on those, but I occasionally envy the possibilities. However, I must say that in my wildest dreams, I never imagined Ted dying. First and foremost, he is not dead. He is doing fine right now. Please keep in mind that, while this is presented from my point of view, Ted was the actual person in the center of it. I was only a casualty. It took many, many therapy sessions to accept that it wasn't my fault. I was simply the unfortunate one who drew the short stick. Years of violence and dismissive behavior from their family shaped Ash into the person he is now. That would have come out somehow, regardless of my role. I'd like to think that something convinced him to see a real therapist, and that it was dealt with in a safe, healthy manner. But I suppose we will never know. The one thing I've learned to appreciate is that I was the one who broke the camel's back, not B1's daughter. Things would have been significantly different, and far more terrifying. Ted was also involved. As you may recall, I maintained contact with B6 during the divorce, 
but at the recommendation of many of you and other individuals in my life, I took a step back and removed myself from him. A few months later, B6 phoned me and asked whether I had heard from Ted recently, which I had not. He stated that some family matters had occurred, he did not specify what, and I did not inquire, and that several of them had attempted to contact him but had been unsuccessful. He informed me he was worried and that he was planning to visit our city to check on him and let him know if I heard anything from him. I knew Ted was keeping his family at a remove, especially B6, so it didn't surprise me that they hadn't heard from him. To be fair, Ted is unlikely to simply disregard a family email. I sent him a message informing him that B6 had contacted me looking for him, but I did not hear back from him. Ted and I had separated ourselves from each other by that point, as stated in my several updates, so his lack of response was not surprising. But he read my message. Fast forward approximately two weeks, and B6 tells me he's in town and wants to meet with me. I said yes because I missed him and invited him to dinner at a new restaurant that I thought he would enjoy. He responded no, only coffee. That was strange because B6 is a huge foodie who never turns down new restaurants, but I assumed he was only in town for a few days and wanted to spend more time with Ted. We met at my park, and he seemed tough. I only remember taking a step back and feeling dread, that feeling you get when you know someone is going to tell you bad news. To be honest, I expected him to tell me that Ash had returned to town, but he just seemed defeated. He told me that a few more things had come to light in the family, but I wasn't very interested, so I didn't ask for specifics. I'm sorry I can't supply more juicy gossip, which I know you enjoy. When he arrived to check on Ted he saw him in a serious downward spiral. Ted had never been a big drinker, only socially and on rare occasions, but when B6 arrived at his house at 10 a.m. on a Saturday, he was utterly intoxicated. B6 stayed with him and sobered him up until Sunday, when he caught him up on the family situation. B6 went out to retrieve his belongings from his hotel and returned to find Ted absolutely comatose. Ted spent some time in the hospital when he called for help. I'm not sure if anything else occurred to him or if it was just the accumulation of everything that had happened over the previous two years catching up with him, but it appears to me that he had been on a self-destructive bender for quite some time. When I discussed it with my therapist, she said that it might make logic and help to explain the divorce. Maybe I'm simply looking for an explanation for why he divorced me after all these years, but knowing Ted the way I do it makes sense. He was always an excellent guardian. I suppose he developed that trait early in life while defending Ash. He's the type of person that keeps an eye out for girls drinking at a pub and always stops to see whether an unaccompanied child is safe. He also has some controlling tendencies, which often cause him worry. He is an excellent planner, but he struggles when things do not go as planned. It makes him strict at times, but also highly dependable. Those are all qualities I've always admired about him. During our chats before to the divorce, he repeatedly apologized for not being able to protect me and for putting me in danger. Even though I believed I'd persuaded him that it wasn't his fault, I guess he wasn't convinced. He was also coming to terms with the fact that his family was not as nice as he imagined. He recognized he had contributed to the family's dismissive behavior throughout their upbringing. Realizing how awful and horrifying his history was, as well as how wicked some of his brothers are, takes its toll on a person. He was suffering with his own trauma, intense remorse, and a sense of powerlessness. Ted ended up going to a rehab center for a while. He would not allow me visit, but he did send me emails. They are a little too personal to discuss with you, but reading them was an emotionally charged experience. The first few apologized for worrying me and assured me that he was fine. Some were rambling, and that is coming from me. Others were genuinely pretty good. It was an interesting journey to see him go from hyper-polite and apologetic to the man I fell in love with. It was also fascinating to watch him assimilate what I had been saying for years and get insight into things I had never noticed before. Overall, I believe it was cathartic for him. I think writing is the finest release, which is why I'm here. It enabled him to arrange his ideas. I'm not sure why he emails me personally rather than keeping a diary or sending emails to himself, but I'm not complaining. There was one email in which he was angry at everyone and everything. Everything went wrong, and he was frustrated. I felt quite relieved. It was fantastic to see his light returning. When he first emailed me, he suggested that I not respond to his emails and instead listen or read. If I wanted to, I could just remove them and he would have no idea. In the angry email, he addressed me by a moniker he had not used in years, since before we married. That really pissed me up. It was not something serious. He was talking about a trip we'd taken with some buddies. They ended up breaking up in the middle of it because they didn't want to return home because everything had already been paid for but they also refused to remain with each other. As a result, 
we had to divide the boys and girls into groups to complete the planned tasks. He felt miserable the whole time. He responded something like, I have not forgiven Alyssa for Venice, it was supposed to be you, so when I... There's nothing wrong with the pet name, but it only reminded me of everything I'd lost and all the memories. I disregarded his request and responded to his email. This resulted in increased correspondence between the two of us. He didn't take it hard when I responded, so I'm not sure if that was his purpose all along or not, but we just corresponded back and forth for a few weeks, which was pleasant. We never discussed Ash or his family when we emailed. I'm not sure if it was because it didn't come up naturally or if he was avoiding the topic, but it was good to communicate with him like we did when we first met. We used to converse using Facebook Messenger, and just writing to him reminded me of those days. It's ridiculous how much I still adore him and how much I miss him. Those foolish emails felt like getting my best buddy back. Even if he wasn't my spouse anymore. He's presently back at his place with B3. His wife and dog lived with him for a while, yay remote work, until he was well adjusted. He now takes antidepressants, has a larger support network, and is feeling much better. He stopped shutting people off while still setting healthy limits, which is fantastic. He's reconnected with B3, B4, and B6, his closest friends aside from Ash, and has lost contact with everyone else. I feel awful for his nibblings because I know he was quite attached to some of them and misses them. But yes, that is something he absolutely needed. For what it's worth, B6 has no touch with anyone. He was always distant with everyone except Ted and Ash, which I assume was because he knew. But after all, he's moving closer to B4 and B3, so there's another silver lining. I'm not clear how B3 and B4 interact with everyone else, but I know B4 is involved. He clearly understands and respects Ted's boundaries and does not share information with or about him. Ted and I have met a few times, sometimes for friends' activities, sometimes just to catch up, and I can tell he is doing well. He has regained the weight he lost, and his hair is glossy again. His freckles are no longer visible, indicating that he has spent time in the sun, which is beneficial, and his shoulders no longer slump. He returned to his job this week. He was placed on leave of absence, and I can tell it gives him a sense of purpose. He was never able to stop doing anything, so I can image how uncomfortable that time was for him. As a result, we visited a shelter, where he adopted an elderly cat. His name is Socks, I believe because he has white paws. He is a wonderful and affectionate cat. He's also missing many teeth. Ted has been attempting to title him Macbeth, but he does not appear to enjoy it. In Ted's defense, Socks does not respond to Macbeth, so perhaps he will succeed. Tortilla was delighted to see Ted when I visited them. She didn't particularly care for Socks, but that's because she dislikes animals larger than herself. As I previously stated, I am currently living on the East Coast, and 2022 was really difficult for us. Two hurricanes slammed my town, and my apartment flooded during the emergency. My father regularly welcomes us to their house, so Tortilla and I were safe, but that sucked. I'm not sure if it was a message from the cosmos, divine intervention, or whatever, but the two pairs of shoes I preserved were wrecked. Both of them. I did everything I could to salvage them, even consulting with professionals, but they were beyond repair. I mean, it wasn't just those two shoes, half of my goods had to be replaced, along with a slew of other sentimental items. But you already know about the shoes and my devotion to them, even though they were a biohazard. My poor apartment has been through a lot. The floorboards had to be removed due to water damage, and they were already rotting and molding underneath by the time we were able to enter. So it was a significant expense to correct. Unfortunately, much of my furniture and appliances, including the robot mop, had to be replaced. For the record, I did have sandbags, but it was probably too much for them. Insurance covered some of the repairs, but definitely not all. Insurance claims are terrible, but it turned out to be the greatest alternative for fixing things and selling the apartment. I'd always moaned about moving, but moving with only a few boxes was especially unpleasant. I never brought so little with me to college. So I'm now staying with my parents. It's a little frustrating, but I'm grateful to be here with them. The house feels a little lonely because the last of my sisters has recently moved away to college, so it's silent save for the cats running about. But, hey, cats are excellent company. I am in the process of closing on a new apartment in a high-rise, so hopefully this will not happen again. I'll miss my park, but the new apartment is in an excellent position, with everything close. I could also bike to work if I wanted to, but I'd need to learn how to ride first. Why don't I know how to ride a bicycle? Because my father was overprotective and worried we would die if we rode a bike. I'm not sure if I'm too old to learn to ride a bike right now, but I'm willing to damage my ego by trying training wheels. 
Tortilla will have plenty of bright spots in her new residence because the windows are much larger. I plan to build a catio at my previous home since I had a little terrace, but the current location has a balcony, which appears to be a little risky for a catio. So that's life right now. I've been prioritizing work and spending time with my parents. I scheduled a trip for March, and it will be my first time traveling alone. I'm a little nervous because I've never had to organize a trip on my own. Did I mention Ted is an excellent planner? I have no idea if I'm doing it correctly, but that's the goal. I've been taking classes in the language of the place I'm going, so we'll see how much I learn. I want to share something as well, which is why I ended up writing this update and using the title I chose. I didn't include it in the TLDR because I don't want the haters to read everything I write. If they don't want to, why should they? When Six called me about Ted I was worried he was telling me that Ash had returned. As you now understand, this was not the case. When Ted sought assistance, I got a letter at my parents' home. It was a letter from Ashley. I didn't feel dread for the first time in two years, after the incident. I'm not sure if it's because I was receiving Ted's emails, or if I had done some wonderful healing. My therapist definitely should start charging me more. When I offered her a raise, she declined, claiming that it does not work that way. But yes, I read it. He apologized. He also admitted to several things he had done to me that I had never realized were microaggressions on his behalf. He admitted to a number of his behaviors that had always troubled me. He did not attempt to justify anything, only apologized. He revealed a couple other facts that were both surprising and unsurprising, as well as some that you guessed. It felt a little rambling and frantic, but I understand. He apologized for hurting Ted, said he knew what Ted was going through better than anybody else, and admitted that he had caused irreparable damage and would never be in Ted's life again. Even if he couldn't assist his brother after everything he had done, he knew that admitting his sins would help him make amends to me. Even if Ted had no idea it was a little way for him to implicitly apologize to him. He stated something interesting. I'm sorry I broke your marriage, but I don't believe I ruined your life. Ted would not have picked you unless you were resilient. He also thanked me for trying. I tried really hard at first to be friends with him, but after the occurrence, it was a no-go. He stated he had given up on people other than Ted trying for him, and he regretted never giving me a chance. He said he was envious that I could bring Ted happiness in ways he couldn't and he hated that Ted had lost it because of him. I believe it was simply a method for him to alleviate his guilt over harming his favorite person and observing the impact it had on him while also respecting his limits. I mean, he disrespected mine, but I understand. I have not told Ted about the letter. I do not think I will either. I told B6 and while he was angry at first, he eventually understood and accepted it. He told me it was up to me whether I informed Ted or not, that he didn't think it would do much harm but wouldn't help either. So if I felt obliged to tell or show him, I would wait till he was in a better state, and then run it by his therapist, or do it in therapy. Final thoughts. Christmas has come and gone again, and this time I spent it with my family. My sisters are the finest, and they each gave me a pair of shoes to commemorate significant life events. They gave me an empty shoe box to represent the pair I'll need to purchase to begin this new journey. It was the most heartfelt gift I've ever received and it made me cry for the majority of Christmas morning. I met Ted for New Year's. We were both invited to a mutual friend's party, and we had a wonderful time. We didn't spend the entire time together on purpose, but we did frequently find ourselves having our own talks without being impolite to others and simply laughing together. When midnight struck, I was seated in the back, away from the couples, and he sat next to me, resting his head on my shoulder. We simply remained in comfortable stillness as everyone else rang in the new year. It's such a comfort to have Ted, our friend back. I still love him. I probably always will. I've tried distance, no contact, and sleeping with someone else to get him out of my system, but it doesn't work. I'm not sure if he's my fated soulmate, and we'll always gravitate toward each other, or if it's simply the comfort and convenience of being together for so long. But I can't help but love him. I love the man he was before and the one he is today. I adore the one he was in between, and to be honest, I'll probably love the one he'll be every day after that. I will not give up on him, even if I have to. I'd rather keep him as a friend than constantly pushing him away, especially since he makes me happy. I deserve to be happy, and he makes me happy. Is this so wrong? I know most of you keep saying it was good riddance, that he did me a favor and that we should simply stop talking. But I miss him. Maybe it makes me stupid but well, at least I'll be stupid and content. If he asks me to take a step back, I will, but I'm content to be happy right now and worry about it later. I believe both of us deserve it. We both still have a lot of work to do and more healing is on the way. But for the time being, things are going well, 
which I believe we both need. I believe that all of us, including you, require good. If you've read this far, I appreciate you taking the time. I wish you all the best. May you find $20 in your pocket, may your favorite drink be available in the shop, and may your coffee be prepared to perfection. But seriously, thank you for always allowing me to communicate about my life without being judged, with love, acceptance, and compassion. Every single one of you is incredible and kind. Please know that I admire and cherish each of you individually. Thank you for taking care of me. Love, Ellie and Tortilla. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so and hit the notification bell to stay updated with more shocking real-life stories happening around you.